You never know where an emergency vehicle is headed. Heart attacks, strokes, shortness of breath. Working fires, biohazard contamination, search and rescue. Robberies in progress, shootings, car accidents. Oftentimes, drivers aren't sure what to do as emergency vehicles approach. When you see and hear sirens and lights, safely pull over to the right and stop. By doing so, this will allow emergency vehicles to safely pass and continue to their emergency. Driver safety is a responsibility for everyone. Not following the driver safety law for emergency vehicles puts everyone at risk. From emergency personnel, civilian drivers, and people who are waiting help. Not only is driver safety the safe thing to do, it's the law. This can carry points on your license and a fine. So let's be safe. Remember, sirens and lights move to the right. Hello and welcome to Safety in the City. I'm your host, Blaine Griffin, Executive Director of the Community Relations Board for the City of Cleveland. We're having an in-depth series about the challenges and the solutions that we're doing to address public safety in the City of Cleveland. Today we have with us our Chief of Police, Chief Calvin Williams. Chief, how are you today? Hi, Director. Great. I'm good. Chief, you know we've had a tough summer so far. We've had an uptick in homicides. We've had some very high profile uh, tragic shootings of young people and other things that have taken place in this city. I, I really like for you to talk a little bit about our overall strategy. What trends are you seeing? What kind of trends are we seeing right now in the community? Well, right now, Director, uh, there have been some challenges uh, to this summer uh, in addressing violent crime in the city. Uh, but we have strategies in place to address violent crime. Uh, we have a, uh, a V Group initiative that basically targets gun violence in the city. Uh, we also conduct uh, on a daily basis gun suppression initiatives from the district uh, stations. The commanders put officers out there to address people that may be carrying guns. We have partnerships with our federal partners uh, from the FBI, the ATF, Department of uh, uh, Public Safety from the state side. And they assist us not only in the uh, reduction of crime in the city and addressing gun violence, but also in the prosecution after those crimes at both the uh, state and the federal level. That's great. So you have a lot of partnerships in place and you have a strategy of how to address this at this point. Yes, okay. yes. But, but, but Chief, what are we seeing? Is this a more aggressive, more impulsive type of situation? Um, what are we seeing as far as the type of people that we're seeing commit crime in our community? Uh, most of the uh, violent issues that happen in our city, Director, uh, are really uh, things that happen spur of the moment. Uh, we've seen that most aren't planned events. Uh, groups of people get together, they have disagreements, and then violence results because there are a lot of people out now um, that carry weapons. And we're doing everything we can to address uh, the gun proliferation problem in the city. And, and, and there are a lot of things that uh, we are doing about it, but there's a lot more that we can and we will do about it as things progress this summer. So, in other words, you know, a lot of these folks that are having these issues know each other. Exactly. It's not like a random act. No. That is just no. random people being shot and there's somebody no. walking around shooting random. These are disputes between people or groups that end up in these type of acts. Exactly. And when you add, um, I'd say, youth to that mix, when you add, uh, again, the pre prevalence of guns, uh, not just in this city, uh, but across this country, then that's a, that's a volatile mix. And, and people, for some reason, uh, in this day and age, like to settle their disputes with violence, with a weapon, uh, instead of through other means. So we try to make sure that we have officers out there daily that are looking to interdict uh, these issues that happen in our community. Uh, whether it be at a recreation center, whether it be uh, on the streets, whether it be at a house party or block party, we try to make sure we get ahead of that. that that's, that's good to hear, Chief. And, and comparing us to other cities, I know Chicago just recently had a very violent weekend yes. and has been known to have high statistics yeah. in crime. Yes, I know Indianapolis had a very tough weekend, New Orleans. You go on and on, cities that's comparable in our size mm -hmm. and larger that are starting to have some real issues. New York City 
that was used to be one of the safest cities. Yes. Um, is Cleveland a very dangerous city? Or tell us the real story about what the statistics are saying. Uh, no, no, not at all, Director. Uh, as a matter of fact, uh, over the past uh, six years, six and a half years, uh, violent crime in the city has gone down each and every year. Um, there are times when we have up upticks in, in certain crime categories, whether it be robberies or assaults or homicides. But if you look at the overall crime picture within the city of Cleveland since 2006, violent crime has been reduced in this city each and every year. And people should understand that. And, you know, it's highlighted more now. Uh, the media is everywhere. Uh, social media is a big driver of how people feel about crime and about issues in the city. Uh, but overall, over the past uh, seven years, uh, almost seven and a half years, violent crime in the city of Cleveland is down. So even though we have some sensational um, homicides and things that have yes, taken place yes. and the media has reported on those unfortunate incidents. And let's make this clear. You and I and all of us know that one homicide one, exactly. is, 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 you know, takes a toll on all of us. Right. Uh, so we're not going to sit back and say about statistics because if it happens to one person, it's too many. But generally, the body of work that crime is doing better in the city of Cleveland. Right. And, and Director, that's not to say that, you know, we're doing great. Uh, that we're the best out there, uh, you know, that things are great in the city, but overall things are better this year compared to last year, compared to the year before. And uh, as you stated earlier, even one homicide, one shooting, one robbery is one too many uh, for the men and women of the Cleveland Division of Police, and we strive to make sure that we eradicate it, period. Now, can we achieve that? Probably not in this lifetime, but that's our goal. Every day, the men and women go out there and try to make sure they keep the city safe for the people that live in it. Now, now, Chief, you know, I heard you talk about this before, and I really want people to understand about intelligence-led policing. Mm -hmm. Charles Dickens once said that there's a tale of two cities often, yes. that one city is the best of times, another part of the city is the worst of times. We know that there's hot spots, but you and your guys do a great job of actually pinpointing where those problems are. Tell right. us about intelligence-led policing and how you use statistical analysis in order to identify where to target it. Well, we have a process. Uh, we have officers, both officers and civilians, dedicated uh, within the division to look at our crime stats on a daily basis. Uh, they map hot spots within the city. That information gets sent out to the district commanders and to the other units that are charged with ensuring safety of the city and we not only respond to that, but we try to get ahead of those trends. I mean, we know that our major thoroughfares, we're on one now, 93rd and Kinsman, right. uh, more people, more issues. So our district commanders understand that, and they police those major thoroughfares. But we also get into the hot spots that happen within our neighborhoods, on some of the side streets, at certain parks, at certain recreation centers, and we make sure that we try to get on that early. But it's a process that we go through. It's an analysis process. We have crime analysts, and we have people that really delve into issues that are happening in the city, and then we address those issues once they're identified. And again, we try to stay ahead of those trends that we know we're gonna have issues in the neighborhood. Then we try to put the resources there before we have those issues. Chief, tell us, you mentioned it earlier, but I would like for you to expound upon what is VGRIP? What is the acronym? What does it say? And then what do you actually do with VGRIP? Uh, VGRIP is a violence gun interdiction program. Basically what VGRIP does, it pulls the resources on a federal, state, and local level to address gun violence in a particular area. Uh, VGRIP squads are sent out in certain hotspots in the city that we have problems with say felonious assaults, shootings, robberies in those areas, homicides. So we can deploy a V-Group squad in certain areas of the city and that squad can concentrate in those areas for extended periods of time. Uh, we've had V-Group squads in areas up to three or four months to make sure that we eradicate that problem in that area. And then we can move those squads around the city based on our intelligence, uh, our fusion center activity, and they're monitoring of what's going on in the city and some of the trends through our crime analysis unit. That's great. That's great, Chief. And you recently was able to just add another gang unit. 
Tell us yes. about the gang unit that you just had. Yeah, currently uh, V Grip is mainly centered around our uh, gang unit in the city. Uh, prior to a couple weeks ago, there were two squads assigned to that gang unit. Uh, we added a third squad. That third squad is basically a floater squad. Uh, it's basically going to be like our response squad and our interdiction squad. Uh, v Grip will still be stationed uh, or uh, led out of certain areas of the city where we're experiencing increases, where they'd be in, in violent crimes such as homicides, felonious assaults, or robberies. Those squads will still be embedded in those areas, taking care of business, but we have a third squad that we can basically send around the city as the need arises. That's great. Now, Chief, you mentioned a little bit about gangs, and I know we like to call them group member involved individuals, and we try to work and target where those gangs are and who they are. Yes. We've had a group called the Heartless Felons that, or the HF, and we have a lot of people that you guys just had a major uh, uh, sweep of yes. that group along with the prosecutors and others. Tell us about your efforts to deal with some of the group member, the group member involved violence that we have in the city. Well, Director, we, we don't um, particularly um, try to put names out there of gangs because that kind of gives them power. Uh, but Good we point. do concentrate on those coordinated activities by certain indiv individuals in the city. Uh, there are, and I hate to use the term gangs, but there are groups that are in different parts of the city that cause us issues and we concentrate on those groups and we try to eradicate whatever they're doing to disturb the, the, the peace and quiet and the safety of our neighborhoods. And, and if that means that we have to round up 30 or 40 people and put them in jail, that's what we do. Uh, we also have long-term investigations on some of those groups and, and, and we try to culminate that as fast as possible to get those people out of our neighborhoods. And those investigations start at the federal level and go down to the state and the local level also. But we, we have a, a coordinated effort on all fronts and all levels of government, on all levels of law enforcement to address some of the, the group violence that happens in the city of Cleveland. And I like what you said about you don't like giving names of these groups because no. then it empowers them. It's right. almost like it's a badge of honor to be disruptive and a part of these groups. So I, I like that. I hope our audience is really listening to that. I, I, I do want to touch on the fact that um, you have a lot of people out here that say we need more police. And I'm pretty sure, you know, I wouldn't, I wouldn't doubt for one minute you would love to have hundreds more police officers if you can exactly. have more added to your force. But give us the reality of the class that recently graduated mm -hmm. and how you're working with the mayor's leadership to try to get more police officers on our street and, and how you're working on the optimal, uh, optimal force. Yes. Uh, currently, uh, our staffing number for the division is about 1,500 officers total, sworn officers. Uh, we recently graduated a class of about 39 officers in July. Uh, we have two classes currently in our police academy. One class will graduate of about 39, 40 officers in August. Uh, we just started a class about four days ago. Uh, that class is comprised of about 60 officers, uh, three of which are firefighters to go into our fire arson unit for the division. And those uh, members of that current class, that class of 60, are due to graduate sometime in, fe in February of 2015. Uh, we also are anticipating giving an entrance exam. So if there's anybody out there uh, that wants to get involved and wants to be a part of the solution for the city and for making it safer for our residents, then by all means, listen up for the announcement for our incoming entrance exam, probably in January or February of 2015. Uh, we're looking for a few good men and women uh, to join the ranks of the division and to help make the city safer and keep us uh, progressing in tamping down violent crime in the city. That's great to hear. So everybody that heard that, you have an opportunity to look for an entrance exam in the early part of 2015. So anybody that wants to be part of the solution, please pay attention because you can't take the police test. I, I, I agree that you said that. Yes. Chief, tell me about diversity. And I'm talking about, you know, we have a diverse community in the city of Cleveland. Mm -hmm. African-American, Hispanic, uh, white, we have LGBT community, we have a lot of diversity. How yes. do you try to look at making sure that you ensure diversity as people are coming into your police ranks? Yeah, well currently, Director, as I say, stated, we're going to um, conduct an entrance exam the first quarter of 2015. And what we're doing now to increase our diversity, to um, 
increase the diversity within the ranks of the division, we're revamping our recruitment efforts, our, our recruitment program for the Division of Police. So that's a process that's probably going to take about three months. We want to make sure that, first of all, that we get qualified candidates uh, within the division. And then after that, we want to make sure that those candidates are diverse, that they represent the city of Cleveland. And it's upon us as the members of the division now to make sure that we have a program of recruitment, a program of retention that speaks to diversity within the city. And I can assure you, as chief of this division, we will make sure that happens. That's great. That's good to hear, Chief. Chief, we have some exciting events coming up. Yes. It's just been announced that the city of Cleveland will get the Republican National Committee's convention, where we will potentially elect, coming from the city of Cleveland, nominate the most powerful person in the world. And yes. at the end of the day, you're going to be the person that more than likely will be the point person to ensure all that safety. Yes. You also have the Gay Games. You also have the Rock and Roll Hall of Fame. A lot of big events coming up. Yes. How are you working with other folks? And tell us about some of the plans you have to deal with the RNC, Gay Games, and all these other events. Yes. Uh, for, first off, Der Director, I'd like to um, kind of remind people that Cleveland is not new to big events. You know, uh, from the movies that have uh, taken place within the city, from Marine Week, which people remember was a great success. Uh, to things like the gay games, the senior games, uh, to our playoff uh, appearances in the past. Uh, I mean, this is what we do. So make no mistake, Cleveland will be prepared for the Republican National Convention in 2016. Uh, a lot of things that we're doing now, two days out from the preliminary announcement, are getting together with some of our federal partners and starting to just talk and communicate about the things that are going to come. Uh, there's a system that's set up for events like this, and the Division of Police, the City of Cleveland, all of our safety forces will basically be plugged into that system and, and is a system that's worked across the country. There'll be certain aspects of that system that we tweak here in the city uh, because we're a little different than other cities, and, but we'll make sure that things work out to the best advantage, not just of the people attending the convention, but for the city as a whole, because we still have to run a city even during that week when the convention people are here. So make no mistake, uh, we're in line and ready and able to take on the challenge of the RNC. Again, we're, we're built for this. This is what we do every day. This is what we do. Exactly. Well, well, one of the good things that I heard you mention the other day when we were in the meeting is that you may potentially for that time get uh, several hundred or several thousand more police officers to help exactly. with safety. And I've been to a convention yes. in uh, Charlotte in 2012. And you get officers from all over the country. So it'd be a heck of an experience to have all of those officers that get a chance to come to Cleveland. You also get a yes. lot of infrastructure improvements that we yes. get to keep once they go back home. Uh, so I'm really yeah. glad of some of those tools as exactly. well. Exactly. That, that's a good part of, of, of getting a national convention. Uh, I mean, there, there are, are, there's going to be funding available for definitely training, uh, not just the of officers in public safety, but in people that work in the city in general, uh, within city government. Uh, opportunities for equipment purchases, infrastructure improvements, things like that, that are going to stay uh, once the convention is over. But yes, we do have to reach out probably beyond the state of Ohio for the number of officers that are going to be needed and necessary to ensure a safe convention. And that's why uh, the city is going to be taken care of because not every Cleveland police officer is gonna be downtown taking care of the convention. We still have a city to run, a city to secure, so we're gonna bring in upwards of three to 4,000 officers from within the state and outside the state uh, to assist in securing the convention, and then our officers that work here in the city will do what we do every day and keep the city safe. Chief, you recently had a demonstration that you're doing with some of your officers I don't know how many, but you're, you're experimenting with body cameras. Yes. And in light of some of the things that we've done around, uh, that you've done around police accountability and other mm -hmm. things, uh, tell us about the body cameras and how those work and uh, why you're uh, looking at that very, very closely right now. Well, we, we always look to improve the way we do business, uh, to improve the way we deliver services, and to improve our officer safety. Uh, body cams are just another component in that process. Uh, body cams are really for our officers and for our citizens. It's a tool that helps ensure, first of all, that people are safe 
and that the service that we're delivering is adequate, uh, is above adequate, and that the people know that our officers are going to be fair and impartial in their dealings with the people. But it also protects our officers against false allegations of complaints and things like that because the encounters are definitely going to be caught on camera now. Uh, currently, we're doing a pilot program here in the 4th District with the 100 body cameras and also in the 2nd District on the nearest west side with the 100 body cameras. We'll take a look and evaluate that pilot uh, really to see what some of the infrastructure things are that we need to deal with uh, when it comes to outfitting, say, an entire uh, division of police with upwards of 20 or 1,200 body cameras. So we have to make sure the technology piece, the back end piece as far as infrastructure, storage, retrieval, all that is up to snuff before we actually go with full deployment of the cameras. But the cameras are for everybody. They're for the officer and they're for the public. That's great, that's great. Chief, on November 29, 2012, we had a very unfortunate incident in the city of Cleveland. And to some people, it's, it's challenged our city's collective soul. Mm -hmm. And to some people, it stressed police community relationships. And, you know, we look at police community relationships. I think they're good in some areas. Right. In other areas, we have to work harder on improving police community relationships. Since you've been chief, you've taken charge about police community relationships and why they're so important. What is your vision to improve and maintain strong police community relationships? Well, there are a couple of things we're doing, Director. Uh, we've started actually here, again in the 4th District, uh, a grassroots basic online community policing training program for our officers. Our officers have to get back to the basics of policing, the basics of knowing the people in your neighborhoods that you police, the basics of getting out of the cars, talking to people, and interacting with people so that they help us in solving the problems that happen in those neighborhoods. And we started that here in the 4th District, and once we're done in the 4th, we're going to gravitate to other districts within the city. But we're also in the process of ensuring that our officers attend as many community meetings as possible. Um, if there's a meeting in the 3rd District, the officers that work in the zone that that meeting is being held in are going to attend that meeting and talk to the residents face to face one on one. Uh, we're trying to make sure that both the residents and our officers understand it's a partnership. We can't be the only enforcement arm out there in solving crime and preventing crime. The residents have to be involved. And in order to do that, we have to be able to sit down face to face like we're doing here and talk to each other and listen to each other. So part of our process is to make sure that officers do that. Uh, once we really get deep into this, our officers will be at a certain time and point, certain point in time in this program, our officers are, are, are gonna do more of actually getting out of the cars, going and talking to people. Uh, we're gonna expand our park and walk programs, our foot patrol programs, things like that. But we encourage people out there, you know, if you see an officer and he's driving by or he's sitting in the car or he's you know, on lunch, say hi to him introduce yourself to them. And that's the only way we get this done as a city. That's the only way we bridge that police community relationship gap that we have right now. Uh, and, and just a, a, a small piece on the uh, November 29th issue. Uh, I try not to talk to it because there's a lot of ongoing things, but I do want to say that uh, the city of Cleveland, uh, both on the community side uh, as residents and people that work and live in the city, and on the police side, the officers uh, of the Cleveland Division of Police. Uh, I think everybody has behaved in a way that they should to allow this process to go to fruition, to complete itself. Uh, you know, people look at Cleveland and say that we're gonna have riots, we're gonna do this and that, and Clevelanders are a lot smarter than that. Uh, we don't listen to what people do on the outside. You know, we take care of business here in Cleveland. And from the residents out there, the community groups, the activist groups, we have maintained decorum in this city around this issue, and I want us to keep that. And that says a lot about the integrity of Cleveland. Exactly. That says a lot about, if you really look on the look of it, the police community relationships, that speaks volumes of it as, yes. as well. Uh, a couple of things that I did want to make sure that I wanted to touch base with you with. Mm -hmm. You've talked a lot about this no snitching culture. Mm -hmm. 
And, 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 and a guy that I work with in the Peacemakers Alliance did a great job of really trying to outline this. He says that if I see somebody break into my neighbor's house and I tell on them, that's not, not snitching. snitching. Exactly. But if we're both drug dealers and I go and tell on you because you're selling drugs, we both did the crime, but I'm telling on you, that's snitching. Exactly. So delineating snitching. But the bottom line is, the police can't do this alone. They really need help. Tell us why exactly. it's so important, and it's frustrating when the community doesn't recognize that they play a role in helping you do what you right. need to do in your job. Well, I, I think you put it perfectly, Director. You know, um, first of all, we have to get rid of that no snitching um, adage that people have out there, and, and you kind of defined it perfectly. Uh, but again, it goes back to there are 1,500 officers within the city of Cleveland. There are over 300,000 residents in the city, and then we probably get another 100,000, 150,000 people that actually work in the city that live other places on a day-to-day -day basis. That's more eyes and ears than we can ever imagine on a police force. So if people don't get involved, then solving a lot of crimes that happen out there is real difficult uh, because criminals aren't gonna commit crimes in front of an officer they may commit crimes in front of their neighbor because they're comfortable and they think their neighbor isn't gonna tell on them. But I'm really kind of trying to employ people, you have to. If that person breaks into your neighbor's house and you don't say anything about it, the next week it's probably gonna be your house. Right. Or if that person robs you know, somebody at the bus stop, the next week you're probably gonna be the victim of that same robber. So if we don't get together and say enough is enough and that we're not going to tolerate this and if I see something I'm going to say something then we're, we're, we're kind of doomed director I mean 1500 officers can't do what 300,000 people can do right chief I want to close with this you're the face of the Cleveland Division of Police you are the top person in yeah. charge of the police department we're here at Cleveland's fourth district and I'm looking at this memorial for the fallen officers of the fourth district yes. Anthony Jerome Johnson and Derek Wayne Owens, uh, who recently yeah, uh, and lost some their others lives, and others that yes. lost their lives throughout the city. And we're here in the fourth district. You're the face of the police department. If you want people to know one thing or something, a, a statement about what people should look at and how people should understand how a guy like yourself from Glenville represents the city of Cleveland and the face of the police department, what would it be? Well, director, I, I think it's, you know, come and take a look at this monument. And there are other monuments throughout the city to officers that have given their lives and service to this city and to this community. Officers that have went out there day in and day out, and one day, trying to protect a citizen of this city, they didn't come home. And there's a monument here. There are, there's a monument on the west side. You know, there's a police memorial monument downtown on West 3rd and Lakeside. But those officers don't go out and say, I'm going out here to get paid. They don't say, I'm going out here to arrest people and put them in jail and write tickets. They go out to protect the public. And one day they went out to do that job and they didn't come home. And they leave behind families just like everybody else has a family. So people need to understand, you know, we're not just police officers. You know, we're fathers, sons, brothers, aunts, uncles, nephews, cousins of somebody else out there. So when you look at this badge and this uniform, it's a lot deeper than that. You know, it, it goes way deeper than that. You know, we're people just like everybody else. We just happen to have a badge and a gun. Thanks, Chief. Thanks for your time and appreciate you coming out today. Thank you, Director. Um, this has been Public Safety in the City. Once again, I'm your host, Blaine Griffin, Executive Director of the Community Relations Board. We have a comprehensive plan to address safety in this city. Chief Williams just told you some of the strategies that the police department are using to try to reduce crime and fight for this in the city. But if there's one thing that he said that I want everybody to take home today is that we can't do this and we cannot arrest our way out of this situation. We cannot do this with just arresting our way out of this situation. We need the help from the community. So thank you, Chief. We appreciate you. And you and your guys keep up the great work.